All right, if you got your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you brought them, open them up and turn them on or whatever to 2 Samuel chapter 13. 2 Samuel 13, as you were turning there a few years ago, I shared with our men here at the Summit Church a list uh, that I've compiled over the years of the top nine all-time stupidest quotes that I've actually heard or read. Uh, some of these I borrow from different lists. Some of them I found on my own. I think I've shared them uh, with uh, maybe you before, but I think they bear repeating. Number nine, top, time, all, top nine all-time stupidest quotes. Airplanes are interesting toys, but of no military value. Marshal Ferdinand Falk, the French military strategist, and future World War I commander in 1911. I feel like that explains so much. Uh, number eight, number eight. There is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. That was Kenneth Olson actually said that, founder of Digital Equipment Corporation in 1977. I feel like that didn't age well, as attested to by these little supercomputers we carry around in our pockets right now. Uh, number seven, number seven. Television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. People will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. Daryl Zanuck, president of 20th Century Fox, 1946. Feel like you might've chosen the wrong profession. Number six, number six, we don't like their sound. Groups of guitars are on the way out. Decca Records in a letter explaining why they were rejecting the Beatles to sign them in 1962. Number five, number five, for the majority of people, the use of tobacco has a beneficial effect. Uh, Dr. Ian McDonald, Los Angeles surgeon, quoted in Newsweek, 1969. Uh, number four, number four, this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is of inherently no value to us. That's a Western Union internal memo in 1876. Should have thought a little bit ahead on that one, I think. Uh, number three, number three, nothing of importance happened today. A journal entry by King George III of England on July 4th, 1776. Now, got to be honest with you, I've heard the authenticity of that one disputed, but some swear that it's legit, okay? Number two, number two. Everything that can be invented has been invented. That was a letter of resignation submitted by the commissioner of the U.S. Patents Office in 1899, saying there's no more use for this office. Everything that can be invented has been invented, okay? Number one, for the, now for the stupidest quote of all. By the way, give me some, some dumb music here. For uh, This is like really dumb. Number one, my choices affect nobody but me. That's what I shared with our men. 21st century man. Dumbest statement ever made, and I hear it implied all the time. Our decisions really affect nobody but me. Our decisions have massive impact on those around us. And that's what we're gonna see today in 2 Samuel 13 to 21. You're gonna see how David's sin affected more than just him. Now I wanna give you a little warning as we get started here, and then I'm gonna pray. Today's message is one of those ones that probably needs a lot of emotional padding because it's about the scars of sin and they are ugly and they hurt. And I just wanna say as we walk through these scars that I'm aware that some of you have some deep scars that this passage is gonna open up. And I just want you to know first that God never ever opens up a scar in your life without the intention of mending it to completeness. It is very important for you never to avoid God's word because God's word is good even when it's difficult. But I also wanna be sensitive to where some of you are in these discussions. If you have a young child in here, you might wanna think about taking them to um, Summit Kids because this passage does contain an incident of sexual assault. The description is not graphic, um, but it is in the narrative. Or maybe you have experienced things in your own life related to this, and maybe you just feel better sitting a little closer to the back at one of our campuses so that if it gets too difficult for you, then you can just slip out into the lobby. We understand, we genuinely do and that we care for you. And so I'm gonna pray, and that'll be, a, that'll be a great time for you to make a transition if you need to, whether with your kid or, or, or for you, getting in a, in a better place, okay? All right, let's bow our heads and uh, let me pray and ask for God's help as we walk through um, this very difficult chapter. Father, we thank you that your word is good. And God, even when it causes, as Jeremiah said, indigestion in us, that it's good, ultimately it leads to life. I think of what Moses said, these are not idle words, they are your life. And I pray God that if you need to open up some scars, if you need to revisit some painful chapters, if you need to 
God bring some things to the surface that are difficult to look at. I pray that you would do so in that way that you do that brings healing and grace and not judgment and shame and condemnation. Or that's how we know that you're gonna be here speaking today is is it's not gonna lead to condemnation and shame. It's gonna lead to hope and life. And Lord, that's a miracle. I pray that kind of faith and that kind of power would be upon your word today that you promise won't come back to you void. So use it to bring life, we pray. God, we have expected hearing hearts. By your grace, we are are looking to you. So speak, Lord Jesus, in grace to us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. 2 Samuel 13, after David sinned with Bathsheba, Nathan had told David, the prophet Nathan had told David, 2 Samuel 12, 13, David, God has put away your sin. You shall not die. He forgave David. But then through Nathan, God also said to David these three things. Verse 10, he said, but David, the sword shall never depart from your house. Verse 11, I will take your wives before your eyes and I will give them to your neighbor. He shall lie with your wives in the sight of the son. Verse 14, the son that is born to you from this incident will die. It's like we often say, you can always be forgiven of sin, but you can't unsin. God said to David, you will not die for your sin. You have been forgiven, but there are results and consequences of what you have done. Some of you know this very deeply and very painfully and perhaps very personally that just because God forgives somebody doesn't mean that the impact of their sin goes away, especially for that person's family. Forgiveness can be real and genuine. Consequences and pain remain. In the next five chapters, we're gonna see David's family turn into a nightmare. The painful outworking of his sins, both the sin with Bathsheba as well as others after it. You're gonna see the tragic story of how David's sins affected lots of people besides him. And then you're gonna hear the whisper of hope through it all. First, what I'm gonna do is just walk you through these chapters, walk you through the events of the chapters, and then we're gonna draw some conclusions. Second Samuel 13, David's firstborn son, Amnon, who was the heir to the throne, of course, because he was the firstborn son, becomes consumed with lust for his half-sister, Tamar. Half-sister, David had multiple wives, unfortunately. And Tamar was the daughter of one of his other wives, so Amnon and Tamar had the same dad, David, but different moms, and that makes her his half-sister. Amnon lures Tamar to his bedroom one evening and tries to seduce her, and when that fails, he rapes her. The word rape is actually used. It is aggressive and it is violent. After the incident is over, the text says, verse 15, and then Amnon hated her so that the hate with which he hated her was more intense than the love with which he had loved her. And he said, verse 17, put this woman out of my presence and bolt the door after her. This woman, do you remember how objectification was a theme in David's sin with Bathsheba? When David saw Bathsheba bathing on the the, the house, uh, the, the roof of her house one evening, he asked, who is this woman? Same exact language that Amnon uses there. The answer that came back to David was, well, David, that's Bathsheba, the daughter of so-and-so and the wife of Uriah. And I pointed out that it's like the author is trying to reinforce to David that this woman was not just a beautiful body. This woman also has a name. She's somebody's daughter, somebody's wife, maybe somebody's mother. But David didn't think of her that way as a person with relationships. He thought of her only as an object to satisfy his sexual lust. Well, now we're seeing the sin multiplied in the sun. Tamar is literally just an object to Amnon. She was like a can of Coke. You drink the Coke and then you throw away the can. Verse 18, so the servant put her out and bolted the door after her like Amnon had instructed. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore. And she laid her hand on her head and went away crying aloud as she went. Verse 21, when King David heard of all these things, he was very angry, but... Read the next verse, that was it. He didn't do anything. Never reaches out to Tamar, he never confronts Amnon. We don't know why. Maybe he felt morally compromised, like he could not intervene. Maybe maybe he was just too distracted with kingly problems. Maybe he was just a disengaged dad, we just don't know. Bottom line is though, you got a dad who's walking around angry 
but doing nothing, which is not helping anybody. Beth Moore says that we got way too many dads walking around angry, but doing nothing, which is not the same thing. Being angry is not the same thing as acting justly and redemptively. Well, because of David's passivity, Absalom, who was Tamar's full brother, stepped in to handle things. And so he says to Tamar, verse 20, hold your peace, my sister. Do not take this to heart, which was, of course, colossally bad advice. I mean, how could she not take this to heart? And she should not be quiet. In fact, Absalom should be speaking up for her. How many sex abuse victims have there been who tried to say something only to be told, hold your peace, sister. Don't take this to heart. Like many victims, she did what she was told. Verse 20, so Tamar lived a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. The word desolate, by the way, means stunned or devastated. Tamar was never the same. Her life was shattered. And then Absalom starts to plot revenge, but it's a, a revenge scheme, scheme that is way more about, about him than her. He hatches this two-year scheme whereby he lures Amnon away from the palace, gets him drunk, and then murders him. You need to be really clear. This is not about her. It's not about her healing or her restoration. If it had been about, about her and her healing, he would have done things differently. This is about Absalom, about Absalom and his, and his honor. But Absalom does it. By the way, did you hear that? Getting somebody drunk and murdering them? What does that remind you of? Again, David's sin is being multiplied now in the life of his sons. Well, after the murder, Absalom flees the country for three years and it turns into a national scandal. And that takes us into 2 Samuel 14. Woman comes in, 2 Samuel 14, and tells David this story about having two sons who get in an argument when one of them accidentally kills the other one. And that son who killed the other one had to flee for his life, but then he repents. It was an accidental death, and he wants to come back home, and, and he wants to come back to his mother, but the community won't let him. And now she has no more sons and no heir to take care of her in her old age. Now, David doesn't realize that she's telling one of those stories that's really about him, like the one that Nathan had used when he confronted David about Bathsheba. David's not the spiciest Dorito in the bag when it comes to recognizing these setups. And so David says, well, my judgment, my decision in this is that this son should be allowed to be brought back to the community, he should be restored. This woman then says, you are the man in this story. And David is like, dang it, I fell for it again. <laughs> so David says, okay, well then let's bring Absalom home. And they do. But David refuses to even speak to Absalom. He's still so angry. So Absalom doesn't even see David's face for two more years. That makes five total years since Absalom has spoken to his dad or been in his presence. Eventually, verse 31, chapter 14, Absalom sets a field on fire trying to get his dad's attention. Literally sets a field on fire. Read it. It's the ultimate kid acting out to get his dad's attention story. David finally agrees to see him and gives him the official ceremonial kiss which is a, a formal restoration of their relationship, but there's no real reconciliation. And so Absalom spends the next four years systematically trying to overthrow his father's throne. Now, a few things you should know about Absalom. First, he was tall and really good looking. Text tells us that he had beautiful long hair. His hair alone, chapter 15 says, weighed five pounds. Archaeologists have actually uncovered a picture of, of Absalom. It's this right here. There it is, <laughs> dug that up. That's the man. <laughs> By the way, for those of you who don't know him, that's John Muller, our Capitol Hills campus pastor. Second, not only is he tall, good looking with five pounds of hair, the text tells us he was very politically shrewd. He was smooth. Chapter 15 explains how he would stand outside of his father's palace and whenever people would bring their cases to the king, Absalom would go up to them and he'd put his arm around them and say, wow, you got a real issue there. Unfortunately, my dad is too busy to give you justice. I'm not sure what that was, but um, <laughs> made me feel warm and fuzzy. So if I, were, if I were judge of Israel, Absalom says, if I were judge of Israel, I'd make sure that you got justice. Chapter tells us that when people realized Absalom was the king's son, they would bow down. Oh, this is the king's son. But then he would pick them up and hug them and say, oh, brother, don't, don't bow down to me. I mean, we're the same, you and me, which is kind of absurd. It's like a, one of those trust fund babies turned politician who works to convince the working man, tries to convince the working man that they're just alike. 
You know, I'm dead broke. I only get paid a hundred thousand dollars each for my speeches, and that's going to leave me broke. And that's what Absalom is doing here. He's trying to convince him everybody that he's one of them. And so, verse six of chapter fifteen, Absalom thereby stole the hearts of all of Israel. And then when the time was right, Absalom staged a coup. He mounts a rebellion and drives David out of the palace. And then as a show of power, he sets up a pavilion on the roof and sleeps with some of David's wives after he's driven David out of Jerusalem. That was intended to be a public humiliation of his dad to let everybody know that he had stolen his dad's kingdom. That's how chapter 15 ends. Absalom has stolen David's house, his kingdom, and even his wives. The irony, of course, is that Absalom is doing all of this from the roof of the palace, which was the very place from which David's original sin had begun. The sins of the father have multiplied in the son. Chapter 15 ends with David in abject failure. It says that David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot and with his head covered. He's running for his life, barefoot, head covered, weeping. Those are symbols of utter defeat, utter humiliation. David has lost everything. Eventually, however, you jump over to chapter 18. The tide turns and David is able to muster enough of his army to take back his kingdom. Absalom and his followers are driven out into the wilderness and David's army chases after them. But as they do, David gives these very explicit instructions. Verse five, chapter 18, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. As Absalom is fleeing through the forest, his horse goes under this heavy brush and his, his five pound hairdo gets tangled up and he's literally left suspended in the air. David's men quickly surround him. And one of the guys says, hey, David, King David said not to hurt him, but Joab, the commander of the army who we've seen in here has a penchant for revenge and violence already. He says, that's nonsense. We cannot leave this guy alive. He'll just do this again if we leave him alive. And so he gets three javelins, verse 14, and he thrust all three through Absalom's heart. Meanwhile, people are bringing word back to David about the battle. And every time somebody brings news, David asks them, well, what about Absalom? What about Absalom? Is he safe? Eventually, one of the messengers who knows that Absalom has been killed, but just cannot bring himself to tell David directly says, verse 32, he says, well, may all the enemies of my Lord, the King be like that young man. The next verse describes one of the most heart-wrenching scenes of David's life. Indeed, maybe the entire Old Testament, verse 33. The King was shaken and he went up to the chamber over the gate and he wept shaken, the crushing realization of all that has happened comes down on him. And he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. That is the first time in all of these chapters that David uses the word son for Absalom. But now it's too late. And he says, would I have died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. A couple of weeks ago, I told you that the repetition of a phrase in Hebrew indicates the intensity of emotion. It's their version of writing in all caps. Here, David repeats the phrase, my son, my son, five times. It's the only thing like it in the entire Old Testament. My son, my son, my son, my son, my son. And thus ends the tragic story of David and his son, Absalom. Here's what I want us to draw away from this. Three very important things, not just about your life, but three things that will help you understand your whole Bible. These are three major themes in your Bible. Number one, the sins of the father are multiplied in the children. The sins of the parents are multiplied in the children. I'm gonna put some of these points in the language of fathers with their children because these stories are about a man and his children, but these principles apply to all of our relationships. In fact, you'll notice there are several relational dynamics at work in these chapters. You got brothers with sisters and children back toward their parents and friends toward each other. So these principles apply everywhere, even if I'm gonna put some of them in the language of fathers with children, because I think they first apply there. But regardless of what relation, whether you have kids or not, whether you're married or not, these are gonna apply to you. The sins of the father are multiplied in the children. Last year, we talked about something called the laws of the harvest. And that was the idea that when you sow something, it multiplies. When you plant something, what comes back to you is greater than the seed that you planted, for good or for bad. In fact, I compared it to Bermuda grass. You cannot isolate Bermuda grass in one little section of your yard. Left unchecked, it will take over your entire yard. 
In my old house, my dad pointed out to me that my neighbor had just planted Bermuda grass and he told me that unless I put up some kind of barrier, soon my entire yard would be Bermuda grass also. I didn't want Bermuda grass, so I just moved. I just moved, that's the way I dealt with that. (laughs) Now, we applied the law of the harvest to money and that's a very important application. The financial place that you're in today is the result of decisions you made yesterday. Putting God first in your finances today is like a seed you plant that brings a good harvest later. And that's a very important application. But the law of the harvest shows up everywhere in God's creation. And it applies especially in regards to the seeds of sin or the seeds of righteousness that we sow into our lives and into our families. In fact, in Galatians 6, when Paul uses that phrase, what a man sows, that will he also reap, he is talking specifically about sowing sinful habits into your flesh. He says that whenever you do that, sin grows and grows in you until it takes you over and chokes out all spiritual life in you. In these chapters, what we're seeing is the principle of sowing and reaping work itself out in David's family. David sows lust and betrayal and murder, and it multiplies to much greater degrees in his kids. You can always be forgiven of sin, but you can't unsin. And what a man sows, that will he reap. This is part of what is meant when God says in Exodus 34, I will visit the sins of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. He's not saying when he says that, I'm gonna hold the kids responsible for the sins of the parents. That would be immoral. He's just saying they end up suffering for it. The truth of this principle is illustrated over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament. Take the Genesis story of Joseph. I've told you every important theme in your Bible starts in Genesis and it's contained in Genesis. The rest of the Bible is basically just an expansion, a footnote on the themes that are introduced in the book of Genesis. Same is true with this one. Joseph's brothers are jealous of him and sell him into slavery. But that sin against Joseph, y'all realize that didn't come out of nowhere. Joseph, you see, had been the son of Rachel, who had been his daddy Jacob's favorite wife. Jacob showed extensive favoritism to Rachel, and Joseph was Rachel's kid. And so the sons of Leah, the despised wife, took out their bitterness toward their dad and his favoritism of Joseph's wife instead of their, instead of their, um, Joseph's mom instead of their mom. And that harvested in his sons, that sort of favoritism and strife, by the way, is one of the many problems with polygamy, why the Bible consistently portrays it negatively. So Jacob's sin of favoritism manifests in his sons, but Jacob's sin of favoritism, that didn't come out of nowhere either. You see, Jacob's daddy had played favorites also. Jacob's daddy was named Isaac. And Isaac had favored Jacob's older brother Esau over Jacob because Jacob was, was more to his liking. He was a man's man. So Esau always, sorry, Esau was more to his liking. He was more of a man's man. Esau always got the extra piece of chicken. He always got the last brownie for dessert. Isaac's eyes lit up when Esau walked in the room. He loved to brag about Esau to his friends. Look at what Esau did. Jacob was the the other son. Oh yeah, 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 that other kid. But, But Esau, let me tell you about Esau. Isaac's sin of favoritism multiplied into Jacob, which multiplied into his sons, which resulted in Joseph being betrayed and sold into slavery, and ultimately the entire nation of Israel being enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. One small sin of favoritism in Isaac multiplies into the death, destruction, and the captivity of the entire nation. That's what's being taught in Genesis is that the sins of the parents multiply into the children. Parents, the sobering reality is that our sin affects and shapes our children. They learn and often repeat our mistakes, often to much greater degrees. Studies show, for example, that if you neglect your kids, they likely will grow up neglecting theirs. You abuse them, they often abuse theirs. Hurt people hurt people. You're a workaholic, They grew up with identity issues that manifest in all kinds of toxic ways. You're unfaithful to their mother or their father. They grew up with commitment issues of their own. You fail to be faithful in your giving or you nurse a secret love of money. They grew up materialistic. They overhear you gossiping about or judging others in your home. They grew up with a critical and complaining spirit, self-righteous, have problems getting along with others. It honestly breaks my heart when I see my idols replicated in my children. And I see it all the time. Things that have just become a little too important to me that start to manifest in them. I don't, 
I don't want to be really specific here. It's not that I, I can't handle telling you what's in my heart. I just don't want you to see my kids doing something and be like, ah, that's your daddy's sin. Okay, that's not fair to them. So I'm just, let me just talk in general terms in, in this, okay? Parents, if you worship the idol of success, which some of you do, in other words, you think that being at the top of your field, making lots of money, being the smartest person in the class, that's required to be happy, then your kid absorbs that and they grow up with the pressure of always feeling like they gotta be first or best or top of their class to have any worth. You may never even verbalize it to them, but look into your heart, mom, dad, if you think that the only way, the best way to be happy in life is to be rich and successful, I guarantee you that you are communicating that to your kid in all kinds of ways. You are multiplying that idol into them and that idolatry multiplies into all kinds of pressure and dysfunction in their lives. Or here's one, and this one might sting. If in your heart you believe that a good marriage is necessary for happiness, that is, Happiness in life, you believe, is not, it's not really just discovering God's plan and living it out. No, no, no. You believe there's no way to be happy and be unmarried. You can't be happy and, you can't be really happy and be single. Well, that's an idol you cherish in your heart, and they pick that up. And that means if in God's sovereignty, they end up single or they stay single for a long time, they think life has dealt them an unkind blow and God has abandoned them. That's just your idol manifested in them. Parents, be honest with me right now. You think that God can give somebody a full and complete life without their being married? If your answer to that is not an immediate and unqualified yes, then marriage is likely an idol in your life and you are likely multiplying it in your kids and setting them up for heartache. How about this one? You think there's no way that anybody could be happy unless they look a certain way. And so you want your kid to be good looking and fit and you're never cruel about it with them, but it just leaks out in little comments that you make, little compliments that you give, little remarks you make about others and their appearances. And it becomes obvious to your kids that you think it's only possible to be happy in life if you look a certain way. And so they absorb that idol and it multiplies into all kinds of dangerous fruits in them. Your idol is killing them. Can I do one more? You really want your kid to be an athlete because when you grew up, those were the popular kids. So you put sports ahead of church. Your kid's always gone, rarely at church because they're always on some travel team and that multiplies in them. So when they go off to college, they stop going to church at all. When your first priority, so it becomes no priority for them. Your idol, your obsession multiplied into destruction in them. Y'all get what I'm saying? Now, let me be clear. Am I saying that every sin we see in our kids is our fault? No, of course I'm not saying that. Our kids, especially as they get older, start to become their own people and they make their own decisions. And thank God, sometimes those decisions end up being way better than the ones that we made. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. But I am saying that there is a divine order to how God set things up. And stories like David's and Isaac's and the Bible illustrate that sin works itself out according to the law of the harvest. Our sin multiplies. What a man sows into his family, he also reaps. To even greater degrees than he sowed it. Y'all listen to me, sin is serious. It is deadly serious. That's why John Owen, the Puritan, always said, you gotta be killing sin or it's gonna be killing you. At any given moment, one of those two things is happening. You're either killing the sin in your heart or it is killing you and not just you, but your children and those you influence for generations to come. The sin of the parents is multiplied in the children. Now, that was a little heavy, wasn't it? How about a little good news? Number two. You can break the cycle. You can break the cycle, but how? It wasn't like David sinned once, y'all, and this was all inevitable. Now, in these chapters, we see multiple points of failure. And that's actually really good news because there are multiple places they could have broken the cycle. That means there are multiple places that you can too. Amnon failed by objectifying his sister. Nobody made him do that. Absalom failed by not dealing with his anger properly. And then pursuing revenge, it was really more about him than her. So Absalom failed. But when I read this story, y'all, I find one particular point of failure. One particular point of failure that stands out above the rest that seems to be the linchpin of all the rest of them. And that one failure is the silence of David at some very key moments. 
The first of those moments was where David, after finding out about Tamar's rape, gets mad and then does nothing. Our pastor of counseling, Dr. Brad Hambrick, wrote a, a really helpful article about this event that I found really helpful. Here's what he said. David sought no justice for Tamar, as Deuteronomy 22, verses 25 through 27 prescribed. It was right there in Deuteronomy, what you're supposed to do in that moment. It was David's obligation as king to see that these divine instructions were followed, but he did nothing. Furthermore, based on Absalom's reaction, we're left to believe that David did not even confront Amnon as a father. The most striking feature of this passage is David's indifference. And when, as a king, David did nothing, the people around him found it more difficult to act. Tamar was invisible and ignored, and tragedy followed. Y'all, I cannot help but wonder what might have happened had David stepped in and cared for Tamar. What if he pursued justice on her behalf, brought her into his home instead of her having to live desolate and alone, or comforted Absalom and calmed him down and taught him what godly justice actually looked like? That might have kept, it might have kept Absalom from going on this murderous rage, which ended in his banishment and then a murderous coup. Or I wonder, I wonder what would have happened had David reconciled with Absalom instead of stonewalling him for five years. You know, we can't know for sure, but the silence of David in these chapters is deafening. The psychologist Larry Crabb has an old book called The Silence of Adam. It's been renamed now, Men of Courage, but... The first title was Silence of Adam. I actually like that title better. In which he makes the case that the original sin goes back in part to the silence of Adam. And then he makes the case that the failure of men to step up and lead and protect when they should be has been a dominant problem throughout human history. I've pointed this out before, but when God, when God created Adam and Eve, he put Adam in a position of authority to serve and to protect. Not like he's superior, it's just the roles that he gave to men and women. The Hebrew shows us that in some very important and very distinct ways. Sometimes we miss them in English. God made Adam first and then gave Adam the responsibility to name everything in creation, including Eve. That was a Hebrew way of communicating Adam's leadership role in the relationship. In fact, the apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 that that actually indicates the leadership role that he's supposed to have in the home. That doesn't mean that the man is superior in any way, just that he has to take the lead. God then gives the commands of the garden to, to Adam and Adam is supposed to relay them to Eve and lead her by example in obeying them. Adam is told to love and protect her like his own body. That command is given to him first. Sure, it applies to her, but it's given to him first. He's supposed to lay down his life for her so that she can prosper. Pastor Tony Evans points out that the fall in Genesis 3 came in part through the total abdication of that leadership role by the man. We know that because Genesis 3 says that when the snake tempted Eve, Adam was literally in Hebrew with her, not on the other side of the garden, you know, killing and grilling or doing whatever men do. With her in Hebrew, with literally means elbow to elbow in Hebrew. He watched her as she took of that forbidden fruit. That was not just a failure of spiritual leadership. That was a failure of protection. See, Adam knew that God had said the day that they had of it, they would surely die. So what's Adam waiting on? He's waiting to see if she drops dead when she eats it before he's gonna to touch it. Only when it, she doesn't drop dead does he then take it for himself. In other words, Tony Evans says, the original sin did not begin with an act of commission. The original sin began with an act of omission. The original sin was not just taking of the forbidden fruit. The original sin was a man failing to step up, lead and protect when he was supposed to. And so it makes sense, doesn't it? That God's question to man that evening when he came into the garden looking for them, what was his question? Genesis 3, 9. The Lord God called out and said, where are you? The way I read that is, Adam, where were you? Where were you? Genesis 3, 9 is the question I would want to ask David in these chapters. David, where were you? When Tamar had been abused, where were you? When Absalom needed his daddy, where were you? And it's still God's question to so many of us men. Where are you? Our world suffers because we got a generation of males that never grew up to be men who take up their role as spiritual leaders, passive males, lifelong adolescents, dudes, boys who shave. <laughs> Some of you ladies may feel like you're married to one of those or you're dating one. Why do so many women have to take the lead in counseling when the relationship is in crisis? Man, when your relationship is in trouble, it should be you leading into the counseling office. 
Because God holds you responsible for it. Why do so many men sit back and let their wives do all the parenting? Why are so many women so much more engaged in spiritual growth? I'm not saying that's all true at our church. I'm not trying to like smack all the men. I'm just saying, I'm speaking in generalities here. In fact, after, my first, after I wrote my first book, when I was thinking about writing a second one, my publisher, we had a meeting. My publisher says, we got good news and bad news. He says, you want the good news? I said, give me good news. He said, the good news is you're really, really good at writing to men. He said, bad news is men only buy 15% of Christian books. 85% of Christian books are bought by women. So I'm doing my best now to speak more to women. Veronica is my coach and how I, everything I do. But it just makes me wonder, why don't men read Christian books? What would have happened had David been active in that moment? What if instead of allowing his power to keep him detached in his palace, he'd use his power to pursue justice, to protect, to heal. You can break the cycle. Man, but you gotta act. The obvious question though is why didn't David? Why don't his sons break the cycle? Why is humanity stuck in this perpetual cycle of brokenness and violence? Why does seemingly every king, every leader, every person we look up to, why is it just a part of who we are? Why does everybody disappoint? I mean, think about it. What you got in these three chapters or these five chapters are three men who act like kings, but they're all the wrong kind of kings. David's the passive king, silent when he should be speaking. Amnon is the abusive king, using his power to pleasure himself rather than to serve. Then you got Absalom, the selfish king, who does everything in his power for himself. Why can't any of these guys break the cycle? These chapters scream, don't they? We need a new king. Even the family of David, who has been the best of the best, is hopelessly broken. And see, that's our last consideration. Number three, a new king is coming who will break the cycle. A new king is coming who will break the cycle as David flees out of Jerusalem, barefoot, with his head covered. A picture, I told you, of abject failure. There's this little detail tucked in there you don't want to miss. Some of you saw it and I was like, that's interesting. But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives weeping as he went barefoot and with his head covered. Why does the author go out of their way to tell you where exactly he fled from Jerusalem? Well, see the ascent of the Mount of Olives would later be renamed the Garden of Gethsemane. And see years later, another son of David would walk that same path, weeping, sweating great drops of blood. This future son of David would also have been rejected as king, but unlike David, It was not his own sin that drove him out of Jerusalem, it was ours. And that son of David walked up that same ascent to the Mount of Olives so that he could die for our sins. Make sure you see this, Jesus walked David's same path of shame so that he could redeem David and put back together his kingdom. In this story, David laments, my son Absalom, how I would gladly have died instead of you. David wanted to die for his son sins, but he couldn't. Jesus actually could. And he did. And see, that's how you break the chain of sin. Because Jesus has broken the curse of sin, he can inject grace and life where previously there were only repeating cycles of sin and corruption and death. I love the line of that old hymn that we sing. He breaks the power of canceled sin and sets the prisoner free. On the cross, Jesus canceled your sin. He paid your debt. And a lot of Christians have received that part. But what Isaac Watts, the writer of that hymn was trying to say is he also breaks the power of already canceled sin. He didn't just die to pay the penalty for your sin. He also rose from the dead to break its power over you. Some of you have experienced the forgiveness of sins, but you have never escaped Jesus breaking his power. He breaks the power of canceled sin and he sets the prisoner free. And see, all that's good news, not just for David. That's also good news for Tamar. In this story, Tamar seems all but forgotten. She's never mentioned again. Literally forgotten by David. Literally forgotten by David. But see, y'all, she wasn't forgotten by Jesus. Jesus walked up that hill of brokenness and shame and failed kingdoms weeping so that he could bring healing to her too. 
when he wept like David in the garden of Gethsemane, he was weeping for Tamar. David forgot her, but Jesus didn't. Some of you like Tamar have been hurt by other sins. You've been the recipient of violence. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him smitten by God and afflicted. Yet he was actually wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was laid on him. And that means by his stripes, I can be healed whether my name's David or Tamar. Sometimes I hear people talk about generational curses. Sins in a family's past generation that still manifest in the present. I'll be honest, I, I don't know exactly what I think about all that. But I do know, I do know I can plead the blood of Jesus against any curse or any residue of sin and break it immediately, regardless of where it comes from. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He didn't just die to pay your penalty. He died to release you from sin's power so he can set you a prisoner free. Yo, I'm not captive to any sin of the past, whether mine or somebody else's. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed, it won for me. So see, whether you're a David looking to break the cycle in yourself or a Tamar looking to escape the devastating effects of sins committed against you, Jesus walked up that hill for you. His cross reconciles your past and his resurrection recreates your future. So friend, what I'm telling you, I don't know whether you're David or Tamar, but it is time for you to get up out of that grave and get on with what God has for your future. Love how William Carey talked about it, the missionary. The future is as bright as the promises of God. Now, one special word before I close. Some of you, as I've walked through this, you identify with Tamar. You were failed by your father or a brother, maybe even abused. And I know that's a deep wound that you gotta deal with and I'm not trying to trivialize it. But what I will tell you is this, you can find healing from the wounds of your earthly father in the arms of your heavenly one. I know it because I've seen it in the lives of countless people at this church. Wounded and broken and shameful past transformed by an encounter with the truly loving, perfect father. And I know that as I say that, some of you can't even think about God as father, at least not with any joy because of what your earthly dad did to you. And he was so bad and so neglectful, so abusive or whatever that you can't even hear the word father without thinking of all that he was. Let me give you a perhaps life-changing thought, okay? Here it is. Rather than seeing your heavenly father through the lens of your earthly one, you should start looking at your earthly father through the lens of your heavenly one. Find your completion in your heavenly father and let that help you come to terms with the failures of your earthly dad. In fact, given enough time, you might even be able to forgive him. Are you ready by his power to break the cycle of sin? Are you ready to receive healing? Here's the thing, he can do either of those things. He's rich and abundant in mercy and healing, but you gotta come to him. You gotta open yourself up to him. Scripture says that he stands at the door and knocks. He's doing that with some of you right now. Are you ready to let him in? I want you to stand to your feet, if you would, at all of our campuses. Bow your heads, if you would. Stand to your feet and bow your heads. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask four or five representatives from our prayer team to come up around the altar area at every campus. We've closed these messages. Come on up right now at, at, at different campuses, four or five of you. We've ended these last several messages, I think in a way that's appropriate because they just deal with life and brokenness time to pray for healing, do business with God. This altar is open. It's open for you. Maybe you need to come and pray for somebody else. Maybe you need to pray for God to break the cycle of sin in you. Maybe you need to break it in somebody's life that you're seeing it work its way out. You can pray there in your seat. I, I know you can, but I guarantee you coming up here, kneeling around this altar, talking to one of these men and women will be even more healing and transforming for you. Some of us men need to pray about becoming the spiritual leader in our homes. Man, some of you have abdicated that role of spiritual leader in your home, and now is the time for you to start to turn that around. This morning, why don't you take the first literal step of leading your family spiritually? I mean, literal step. Grab your wife's hand and come down to this altar to pray. Get your entire family, collect all of them and come down here to pray. You can just come to one of these prayer folks and let them pray over your family. Let it be a symbol that you're taking up the responsibility from this day forward. 
Let this be your first act of spiritual leadership. Take that step right now, faith and boldness. Don't go home and, and let God have to ask, where are you? I don't know what God's doing. I'm not trying to prescribe it. I know you can sit there in your seat and do whatever, but our worship teams are gonna come on all of our campuses. I'm gonna pray and then I'm just gonna invite you to come. Why don't you bow your heads right now? Father, I pray. I pray, Father, for those, God, that need to do business with you. I pray that they would find healing and grace in a time of need. I pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. You come now at all of our campuses. You come. Otherwise, just keep your head bowed and you pray right there in your seat, but you come right now if you need that and our worship teams will come in a moment.